and it's another episode of Minds Worth Meeting. Nick Romeo, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here. So it's a pretty exciting time for you. Uh, you've got your first book coming out beginning of the year in January, and I definitely want to get to the book. But first, I kind of want to get to your journey getting to the point where you wrote this book, because you've got a really interesting backstory, a little bit of journalism, a lot of journalism, a little bit of archaeology, a little bit of ancient Greek. Like what brought you to where you are now? Yeah, it's, it's a winding path. I don't know how much coherence I can impose on it, but you know, I guess the, the, the short answer would be um, I, I didn't really go to school for journalism. I, I studied philosophy. And as you mentioned, I studied ancient philosophy. That got me interested in the ancient world broadly. I, I spent a lot of time doing reporting work in Greece for National Geographic and elsewhere, kind of covering interesting archaeological discoveries in that part of the world. Um, my wife's an archaeologist, which which helps pique my interest in that subject. Um, you know, so then I've, I've been working as a journalist for, for quite a while and um, had a sort of brief, not particularly enjoyable stint in finance, but had sort of some background in that world and then ha have been interested in the intersection of kind of economics and political issues. So my my main beat for the last several years, especially for The New Yorker, has been what you might call political economy, to use a somewhat mm -hmm. old-fashioned term. Um, so policy, economics, and really the intersection of those two areas. Yeah, and when we first spoke, the, the archaeology part, you know, I, I definitely noticed that. I've been into ancient archaeology since I was a kid. Um, a couple yeah. of years ago, went to Rome for the first time, and <clears throat> that stuff just really blows my mind. So I think it's a really cool path that you've taken here, uh, which is, uh, you know, I wanted to touch on that for a minute. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. So as far as the journalism goes, uh, you're kind of doing journalism the classic way, uh, the way, you know, you are going there, you're doing the on the ground reporting, you're in the location. Uh, and so how did your area of focus kind of become that intersection of culture, economics and policy? Well, I think it's a really valuable form of inquiry to combine narrative and analysis. So like mm -hmm. you mentioned, if you if you spend time in an area, you just have a different kind of qualitative sense of some of these topics. You know, it's it's one thing to have a, a wonky policy white paper about an issue or even, you know, a very well researched and reported kind of article in the style of The Economist, maybe. It's a different thing to take this narrative mode where, you know, places like the New Yorker put a real premium on character, on story, on kind of giving you a feeling of what it's like. So I think when you combine those two modes, there's something really powerful that happens where you can mm -hmm. kind of motivate readers at a deeper level to, to care about these issues without losing sight of some of the analytical framework that makes the issue important. So, you know, those, those two streams of inquiry have always been sort of wonky and analytical by nature, but I also really appreciate the power of of character, of narrative, of the kind of what is it like feel for some of these issues. And, you know, especially when you're writing about things that can sound kind of technocratic, labor market policy, the details of corporate ownership, I think there's an additional reason to really kind of give a human dimension to these topics. Right. So it's helping people learn something, but also helping people feel something. Well put. Absolutely. Yep. Cool. Have there been any stories that uh, you kind of went into just as a story, but really piqued your interest and made you feel like I, I need to get into this further? You know, the story that kind of piqued my interest for, for this larger book project, um, it came up a few years ago for The New Yorker, quite a, quite a few years now. And there was a, an English kind of policy entrepreneur, a guy who had spent years trying to create labor markets for irregular workers. So what we might mm -hmm. call gig workers in the sure. States. Um, but, you know, really beyond just gig workers, anyone who for some combination of personal or medical reasons could not work a full-time job, but still wanted a job, you know, his insight was, look, private market companies are not serving these folks particularly well. They're siloed across a bunch of different platforms. There are often not many benefits, let alone portable benefits that travel with you across platforms. What if the public sector created a market? Um, so it was a kind of combination. I mean, one one description of this guy is it's like the ideas of um, of Karl Marx, but the mechanisms of Adam Smith. 
And I was really compelled by that combination. You know, it was like unleashing the power of markets and competition, but all of it was in the public interest. So it was okay. this sort of category confusion where, you know, it didn't fit neatly into left or right. And yet it was this really fundamental intervention that could improve labor markets for, for folks in somewhat precarious positions. So when I, when I dug into that story, I thought, you know, this is a, a fascinating idea and it really has a sort of paradigm shifting potential. Um, I wonder if there is a sort of a whole series of these types of policy interventions that are kind of similarly compelling out of the box and, you know, distinctive in refusing to sort of be neatly characterized left or right. Right, right. Which brings us nicely uh, into the book. So it's called The Alternative, How to Build a Just Economy. And I think one of the cool parts about it, it's not just like a compilation of your articles. It's really that deep investigation into how economics is really inseparable from politics and philosophy. And I love a quote you said uh, when we first talked, you said, most economics is just political philosophy with a veneer of science and numerical wizardry to shut down further discussion. Can you explain that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, you know, so this, this insight is, is not really original to me. Uh, many people who are, are much more skilled mathematicians and economists have actually come to the same conclusion. John Maynard hmm. Keynes famously commented that the economist has to be a combination of, of four elements. So there's a mathematician, there's a historian, there's a statesman, and there's a philosopher. Okay. The narrowing of the field to just the first of those four, mathematician, has, has pretty profound political implications. Sure. Um, another Cambridge economist, Joan Robinson, she, she once said that the answers to economic problems are only political questions. And okay. she's mm -hmm. incredibly quotable. So I'll just throw one more out at you. She said, um, the purpose of studying economics is to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. <laughs> okay, I like that. So, okay. You know, to, to get a little bit more contemporary, like while I was doing some reporting on on the state of economics education in the academy, you know, I, I came across some pretty striking anecdotes and examples of how the highly technical, highly mathematical direction the field has taken can really shut down political and moral questions. So right. one graduate student at the London School of Economics was, was teaching a course and during during a discussion section, you know, one of the students asked, well, what's the data tell us about inequality? And this graduate student, to her credit, kind of recognized that this was what you might call a category error. Mm -hmm. There's there's actually nothing in the data that are going to answer the question, what's the perfect or the ideal level of inequality? This right. is a moral and a political question. It depends on values. It's a sort of, it's a matter for philosophy. Um, it's not a matter that you can just look at the data and say, oh, looks like the, the perfect Gini coefficient for right. for inequality in this country should be 0 0.30. Um, right. You have to define that in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, you have to think about trade-offs and these are going to depend on previous moral assumptions about fairness, about um, the ideal role of markets in distributing resources. None of this can be settled by data alone. It's not to say that math and data are not incredibly useful and powerful tools for clarifying or making more precise certain questions, but it's just the sort of recognition that those questions always are going to depend on previous political and philosophical assumptions. I thought that was a, a really striking insight. And, you know, it's one that some of the, the smartest economists in the world today absolutely endorse. I'm, I'm sort of not a renegade at all in saying this. Right, right. Um, going into that a little further into um, not necessarily the inequality, but uh, kind of leveling the playing field a little bit, uh, you write about how work isn't just about making an income, but it goes a lot deeper than that. Uh, it gives us a sense of who we are as individuals in the community. And you write about a town in Austria experimenting with guaranteed jobs. And you make a point that there's a distinction between guaranteed jobs and guaranteed income. Uh, I'd love to hear more about not only that story, but kind of the why it's so important to make that distinction. Absolutely. So to give you a little context, um, this town is, is just outside Vienna, maybe 30 minutes. And it's the site of a classic sociological study from the 1930s, where a, a trio of researchers spent time in this town during the Great Depression, and they were studying the effects of, of unemployment. One of the things they found was that 
once people had a lot of free time because they did not have jobs anymore, it, it had been a factory town, the mill shut down. So almost everyone in the town lost their jobs. And once they had this free time, um, really the social fabric of the town collapsed. Mm -hmm. People used to belong to clubs, organizations, sports teams, societies, literary groups, theater groups, um, athletic groups. All of this went away. And it, it was a little perplexing because people actually had more free time. Um, some people also, you know, they, they were suffering sort of physically. They didn't all have quite enough just to, to survive at a basic level. But even the folks who kind of still had enough, um, they just felt this profound sense of purposelessness. Right, right. One, one person commented, you know, I sort of, I wake up in the morning and then it's just, what do I do all day? I don't know how to spend yep. my time. So the sociologists, they would find people like standing on a bridge, just staring off into space for, for long periods. And the, the sort of psychological ramifications of unemployment were, um, were not widely appreciated. This, this study became a classic for that reason in part. So fast forward to the president, in part for symbolic reasons, but also in part because this is still a region with high unemployment. Some researchers chose this same town as the site of a job guarantee trial. So they wanted to study what happens when anyone who wants a job can have one. So the original study is asking, well, what happens when people can't find a job? How does that affect their mental health? In a way, this new study is just the inverse. Sure. If anyone who wants a job can find one, how, how does that affect them, I mean, including on all of these psychological dimensions? Um, what they've been finding is really fascinating. So I'm happy to just go, go on, but I'll no, pause please. there in case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so, you know, they've been finding a lot of really fascinating results. One thing that's very interesting is that anyone in the study who would prefer to just remain on unemployment benefits, which are relatively generous in Austria, mm -hmm. is free to do so. There's no element of coercion or force. So it's important to distinguish it from the kind of workfare programs that sometimes mm -hmm. people might think about when they think about, you know, a job guarantee. They might think, oh, well, if you're unemployed, you just have to take the first job that comes along. It was important for the researchers to say, look, if you'd prefer to receive unemployment benefits and not do anything, you're welcome to. Strikingly, no one did that. And they've had over 100 participants in this study. Every single person would prefer to work. And right. in order to make that sort of a little bit more tangible, you know, the work that they do is really co-designed with social workers. And it has in mind two basic goals. One, what are their interests and skills? to what are the needs of the community. Right. So, you know, if if there's a, a need to do sort of greening or or public works, beautification projects, great. But if, if you have no interest in that, you don't end up doing that. Maybe you would prefer to work with kids. Maybe mm -hmm. you're good at working with your hands and fixing things. It's really the marriage of the, the needs and the skills that um, sort of guarantees that people are not just uninterested in what they're doing. And, it, really in line with the insights of the original study, what they found is that the, the presence of somewhere to go every day and the, the fact of having colleagues, collaborators, doing something you think is meaningful has incredible psychological benefits for folks. Sure. So even apart from you know, having income, which you know, they could have from their unemployment benefits, really the, the intervention has been that it's, it's a profoundly meaningful thing for people who are otherwise maybe just going to be like that person in the 1930s where that you wake up and you say, what am I going to do all day? Right. Um, right. And so I got to spend some time there. I was on assignment for the New Yorker and it was, it was really striking how even some of the quotes from people today echoed the language of the original uh, participants in that study, like in the 1930s where people would say, you know, I just didn't know how to spend my time. One guy was binge watching a lot of TV. He wasn't yep. sleeping well. As soon as he entered the job guarantee, he started sleeping better. His health improved physically. Um, he really liked going every day. He liked some of the other people in the program. It was it was just a good thing for his his life and his mind. Yeah, and I think anybody who's been through a period of unemployment can kind of understand that mental toll. Uh, you know, I had a period between jobs before I started here at Stern, and for the first couple weeks, it's great. You know, you got every entertainment option available with uh, streaming these days. Uh, you don't have to be anywhere at any particular time, but, you know, after two weeks, three weeks or more, you do get that feeling of what, what am I doing every day? You know, and it's the only, your job is to look for a job, but 
you know, you can only do that for so long before it's like, well, I guess I'll watch the next episode or whatever. And yeah, it, it does have a take a toll on you. Absolutely. You know, and if, if we zoom out for a second to some of the mm -hmm. kind of policy implications and the debates about job guarantee versus, versus UBI, you know, if, if your objection to a job guarantee is that it's going to cost too much, this program in Austria is interesting because mm -hmm. they very intentionally capped the cost such that it came in just below what they would have been spending anyway on the unemployment benefits for these folks. Right. So the, you know, the, that objection is kind of automatically foreclosed. It's if you're in a country with relatively generous unemployment benefits and you can, you can mount a job guarantee without exceeding that budget, it, it's kind of hard to see why you wouldn't be interested in doing that. If you're going to be spending the money anyway, and if people are much more satisfied and if you can actually contribute to some needs in a community, sure. um, infrastructure, green transition, I mean, you can, you can imagine the, the crisis in care work in America it's not hard to think of things that need doing, and it's not hard to think of um, people who are not satisfied in their current jobs. So sure. that's sort of one policy implication that's interesting. You know, one other one, which which kind of zooms us out maybe even one more level, is just that when you have an outside option, this puts pressure on private sector employers. If you if you know that you have a compelling job, let's let's just imagine it pays twenty or twenty five dollars an hour. It's enjoyable. Um, the sort of low wage, low road employers, as they're sometimes called, suddenly they have to compete, right? right? They have to improve benefits. They have to improve the sort of meaningfulness of the work or else they're not, um, they're not going to compete effectively for workers. So what worries some people, which is that private employers might struggle to, to attract and attract workers if they face this competition for, for other people, that's actually the point. We, we want them to struggle. Right. We want them to have to compete. So once again, it, it gets back to what we started with. These sort of economic policy things depend on previous moral assumptions. Sure. And, and do they see uh, private sector wages going up or is it having uh, an actual concrete effect that can be measured at this point? Or is it still kind of in that experimental phase? I think it's a little early to say, and it's also a pretty small trial. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the economists studying it have done a lot of clever sort of statistical modeling to try to answer some of these broader labor market questions. And, and so far, it seems like there hasn't been a strong effect on private sector labor markets. It's not like um, no one is able to find workers like those sure. effects, yeah. those kind of nightmare scenarios that the private sector might worry about are just not happening. Um, hmm. Unclear about the upward pressure on wages to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another thing I wanted to to get to, which is a little bit of a, a turn of the wheel here. Um, there's been a lot of news within the last two years or so about perpetual purpose trusts. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the best uh, example that a lot of our listeners and viewers would know is Patagonia. Um, can you give us a quick summary of what a perpetual purpose trust is for people who've seen the phrase but don't necessarily know what all the, the workings are of that? Absolutely. Yeah. So purpose trusts are, you know, typically for the purpose of individuals, right? I mean, in the past, they're a sort of legal vehicle by which if you have an art collection or a beloved chihuahua and you're worried about what's going to happen to this, this entity, um, you can set up a purpose trust and, you, and you sure. know, the trust is funded and it takes care of this thing and it sort of stipulates how it's going to um, to to be transmitted or cared for. Yeah. And so the, the idea behind a perpetual purpose trust is that businesses can transfer their ownership into a purpose trust and they can do so functionally in perpetuity, such that if I'm a retiring founder, I've spent a long time building a business with key values. Maybe I've capped the compensation at 10 to one between highest and lowest. Mm -hmm. Maybe I do profit sharing. Maybe I donate to nonprofits every year. I'm now interested in, re in retiring. Um, I would like to sell my business and make some money to fund my retirement, mm -hmm. but I'm concerned about just selling to private equity, right? right. I know that when that happens, um, bad results tend to follow. A lot of the things I've, I've worked hard to build could just get decimated. So the purpose trust is a sort of solution to this dilemma for retiring founders or honestly for younger people. I mean, I spoke to a guy in his 40s who has a a bakery here in in Oakland. I'm I'm in Berkeley, and you know, mm -hmm. 
just a few miles away in Oakland, there's there's a bakery called Firebrand. Core of their mission is that they hire folks who were formerly incarcerated or homeless. And so he needed some more funding to kind of scale up to the next level to get into grocery stores around the state or even the country. Um, he was very concerned about the strings that would be attached to that funding. The Purpose right. Trust was this really nice legal vehicle that said, here is the purpose of this business. Um, any funding then has to respect that purpose. So it's this really kind of clever, interesting way of dethroning profit maximization or shareholder primacy as these fundamental features of, of an economy. I mean, they, they simply don't have to define the fundamental purpose of a business. And right. enshrining that in a legal document can be a really powerful way for, for people to guarantee that their values persist, even if they're not still running the company, or even if right. a lot of other funding flows in and the people who want a return on investment, you know, they would then have to sort of recognize like that priority is maybe third or fourth down a list. And we have that list written right here. So, right. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, uh, it's a fascinating way to kind of leave that legacy behind and make sure that uh, like you say, the purpose that that business was started with is is still going to continue uh, after the founders aren't here anymore. It's fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so the book's optimistic message is that there are economic initiatives around the world that are breaking the status quo and that are working, but systemic change is hard. So what are some of the things that we can do as individuals that business leaders can do to kind of nudge towards meaningful change, especially in a system like, you know, in the U.S. where things are pretty, uh, pretty well enshrined at this point. So what, what can we do? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, what you can do, as always, sort of depends on, on who you are. So if, if you own a business, there's, there's a bit more you can do. Um, we were just talking about purpose trusts. Mm -hmm. One thing a purpose trust might protect would be employee ownership. And employee ownership comes up a lot in the book. And you know, it's it's not a new concept. In fact, major American companies used to have pretty high levels of employee ownership. One statistic I'll give you, which I, I found very striking, you know, Sears, the department stores, they yep. in the 1950s, it was pretty common to have employee ownership at Sears. And these included sort of blue collar jobs. You might be a cashier, you might unload trucks, but you had a, a piece of the company. You owned part of it. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if Amazon in in 2019 had the same level of employee ownership that Sears had had in the 1950s. Every Amazon worker, you know, folks at warehouses, people delivering trucks, they would have had something close to $400,000 in ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going pretty far towards creating a middle class. If you extend mm -hmm. that principle to the hundred largest companies in America, um, and you only return to the levels that existed in the 1950s, not, not even going beyond that, you, you could have tens of millions of people with really a significant chunk of capital. Now, you know, I think raising wages is important. It definitely provides some relief. It's a buffer against inflation, et cetera. But it's a little hard to imagine wages alone ever allowing folks, especially at low wage jobs, to accumulate four hundred thousand dollars. That's that's sure. a big chunk of capital. Yep. Um, so I think equity ownership is a really powerful tool. Um, there was a study from the National Center for Employee Ownership comparing the size of retirement accounts at businesses where people had an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan, versus mm -hmm. those that didn't, it was a huge difference. It was something like a little over 200000 versus a little under $20,000. Oh, wow. So once again, I mean, just switching your business over to the ESOP model makes, makes an enormous difference. Giving employees some participation in equity and in upside such that when the business does well, they're making more money. And as you know, they accumulate shares over time, often it's a function of seniority, how these ESOPs work. And then when you retire or you leave, you, you sell your shares and you get a nice, a nice chunk of, of money. And, you know, that's, I think, an, a relatively easy thing. There are tax advantages to ESOPs. Um, there are sort of clear moral advantages. It's something people can feel very proud of. And I, th I think it, it really does go directly at, at some of these questions of wealth inequality, which are just inescapable today. Yeah. One of the big case studies in your book is, and correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Mondragon? Mondragon. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Y can yeah. you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Mondragon is a fascinating case study. They are located in Northern Spain in the Basque country. It's, it's the world's largest collection of worker-owned cooperatives. So mm -hmm. 
it's a truly gigantic operation. There are over 80,000 people who work at one of these co-ops. Um, they make well over $10 billion every year. They compete successfully for contracts around the world. And they do everything from, you know, industrial manufacturing, like making jet engines, making elevators, making subway cars, to consulting work, fundamental research. Um, they have grocery store chains. They have schools. So the cooperative model is this kind of mold into which you can pour lots of different businesses in lots of different sectors. And the basic features of that mold, um, there, there are really two parts. One is um, worker ownership, as the name implies, that they're worker-owned co-ops. So workers have a capital account and they accumulate ownership over time. Um, the ratio of highest to lowest paid employees is six to one. So this, you know, in America, it seems extraordinary. Although over there, many of them are lower than six to one. Many of the co-ops choose to say, we're going to go to three to one. Um, so worker ownership and this very compressed pay ratio, that's one element. The other yeah. element is democratic governance, where every, every member gets a vote. So the, the slogan they have there is one worker, one vote. Okay. Th mm -hmm. This means, you know, people who are on the factory floor are oftentimes voting on really important strategic decisions. So it's important then that management share information, that people are sort of educated, that people are pro-social, that they want to make strategic decisions with the long term in mind rather than just kind of maximize for themselves in the short term. So it's it's a really kind of interesting structure. And um, it's it's a kind of it's a widely cited example, right? I mean it's it's popular not only among sort of people who think that um, capitalism is broken, but it's also popular among people who think like, no, no, capitalism is not broken. And there is this more humane form of it that we can point to in the real world. We don't have to sort of conjure up some entirely alternate social arrangement. We, we can just look at other places where um, income inequality is lower, worker satisfaction is higher, and some form of democracy actually if you care about it in the political sphere, there's not a really good reason necessarily to just abandon it in the in the workplace or in the economy. Right. So they found a way to instill democratic governance and values in the economy, which is pretty striking. Yeah, and I definitely want to uh, point people to uh, your profile on our website, sternstrategy.com, because there are a lot of your New Yorker articles, uh, articles elsewhere that, that really go into uh, these kinds of uh, case studies and real world examples. Great. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when the book comes out, The Alternative, How to Build a Just Economy, uh, when we release this episode, it'll be in within the next week. Uh, are you excited? Are you scared? What? How are you feeling? No, I, you know, I'm really excited. It's 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 been years of reporting and research, and it's it's great to have a chance to talk to folks about these ideas. You know, I think a, a lot of people are very receptive. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, despite a lot of the, the polarization and conflict in the country, it, it's it's actually not at all impossible to find this kind of reasonable middle ground where, sure. you know, if, if you're willing to just sort of get get down to specifics, reason about some of these moral principles that underlie economic arrangements, um, there's, I think, a lot of common ground that can, can still be had. And the, the goal of the book is to try to expose that, highlight it, right. and, and broaden it, sort of have a, a big tent strategy, if you will. Sure. And in the end, we all want to do better. Absolutely. It's, you know, as yeah. long as better is sort of understood in, in, in some way that, um, right, right. like, you know, I mean, if, if better is understood in, in the sort of narrow homo economicus, where like, it's a zero sum game. And as long as I have more than you, it doesn't matter if the earth is destroyed. And right. we're living in like, a society with a crazy level of wealth inequality. I think, you know, that's like the, the challenge is like, how, how do we define better in a way that stands up to scrutiny and that that also maybe extends to our grandkids, right? Sure. Yeah, no, yeah. I love that. And um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to read the book. Uh, so you're teaching at the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, tell me about your courses. What are you teaching? Yeah, so the J School here actually runs um, some local news sites that are grant funded and they're, they're kind of simultaneously pedagogical. They help the grad students become journalists and learn reporting skills. But they're also trying to solve like the news desert problem with the collapse of the business model of the news industry. They, mm -hmm. you know, there are so few local news sites now. So these these 
newspapers actually cover things in this area. One covers Oakland, one covers Richmond. Um, so I'm, I'm the editor of a, a newspaper that the J School publishes. And I, I've got reporters, you know, who are covering um, housing, crime, politics, sports, culture, all kinds of things. And they're, they're actually going out and developing beats and then submitting stories. And um, yeah, so it's been exciting. We're, we're, we're kind of incubating, hopefully, some of the, the next generation of, of journalists. That's yeah. really cool. And, and there's so much... Um citizen journalism these days. And I come from a journalism background. I come from a communications background. Uh, my previous job was working at a hyper local uh, broadcasting group and seeing that kind of erosion of the hyper local uh, uh, service. Uh, it's, it's frustrating. Um, you know, we're in an interesting place here in New Jersey where we've mm -hmm. got New York and Philadelphia on either side. Um, so it does make that hyper local attention and reporting uh, so much more important, and I, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad there are programs that are still prioritizing that. Absolutely, yeah, it's a really cool initiative. Yeah. Um, so I like to get into a quick lightning round. Three mm -hmm. questions. I did not prep you on them. Just want your gut reaction. Okay. What is the best piece of advice a mentor gave you? Ooh. That's a good question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to think about a philosophy instructor who kind of channeling Aristotle um, always emphasized the importance of, of doing things for their own sake. Mm -hmm. So okay. in, instead of pursuing something as a means to some other end, um, the most satisfying things and also the things that you tend to do at the highest level are are the ones where you don't have some ulterior motive, where you just get very interested in the work itself. And I, sure. I think that's nice at a kind of personal and professional level. You know, it, it yeah. could be, you know, that you love to play the piano. It could be that you you like to read ancient Greek. It, it could be that, you know, um, it, it could be all sorts of things, like the sort of the contents matter less than the motivation. And I, I okay. like that reframing where it's like, as long as the motivation has not been sort of corrupted by this, instrumental viewpoint where it's like, what can I get out of it? Right. Uh, that's a, a nice protection against dissatisfaction and disappointment. Okay. I like that. If your journalism students carry one takeaway with them throughout their careers, what would you want that one takeaway to be? <laughs> I'd probably try to cheat and put in like six takeaways to one sentence and then call <laughs> okay. it one, but mm -hmm. I'll resist that temptation and say, you know, I think just like a really intellectually rigorous attempt to interrogate your own preconceptions and to kind of push back against some of your own um, your own ideas to to phrase the counter arguments to your viewpoints in the strongest possible version, so that you're not just kind of coming up with a straw man and saying, "Oh, well, my opposition they they're all just kind of stupid and they're all evil and and you know I figured out truth and righteousness and now I'm going to tell the world about what's true and right." right. I, I think. In order to have any kind of credibility, you have to give the opposition a very careful consideration. And, you know, mm -hmm. in journalism, this means talking to a lot of people, including people you disagree with. And it's not that there's no truth and that, you know, you can't have a viewpoint, but it's that to arrive at that viewpoint in a credible way, you have to kind of have stress tested it right. by, by checking with everyone who disagrees with you and taking seriously what they say. Yeah. So it's the, the true definition of fair and balanced. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So now this is the hardest question. I save the most difficult one for the end. What is your favorite app on your phone? Hmm. There's a, a free, a free one where people volunteer to read classic works of literature. It's called LibriVox. Okay. It's really great. I mean, you can find everything from, from Shakespeare to Tolstoy to Virginia Woolf. Um, as long as it's public domain, uh, all of these books, you can just listen to people do free audiobook readings. And it's, it's kind of nice, you know, you might, you might have someone like living in, um, in Korea, or they, you know, they might be living in France, you get people from around the world who love literature, philosophy, history, and they all just volunteer their time to read audiobooks. So That's whenever cool. I walk the dog or, or do, do a, do a workout, I'd love to fire up some LibriVox. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the book, uh, The Alternative, How to Build a Just Economy, congratulations on it. Um, you know, we're excited to uh, see how it does and to help you uh, get the word out there. Uh, where can people find you online? Yeah. So, 
you know, my, my profile is on the, the Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. They can find me on LinkedIn. I've got an author website. So if you just search my name, it comes up first. Okay. And of course, people can find you at sternstrategy.com. Absolutely. All right. Nick Romeo, thank you so much for your time. Again, congratulations on the book. Uh, we're excited to get our hands on it. Thank you, Justin. Pleasure.